I'll tell you the first law of sustainability. You cannot population growth and or growth in the rates of consumption of resources cannot be sustained. Now, this comes from the arithmetic of exponential growth. You cannot have growth and, you know, for long periods of time. And it comes from the idea of sustainability, which has to mean for a very long time. And how, how long is a long time? Well, long compared to a human lifetime. And when I was first thinking about this, I thought, well, you know, there's that Native American statement about think about your decisions and their effects seven generations out, but, you know, why stop at seven? I mean, that's a very valuable concept, but why stop at seven? So the first law of sustainability is that you can't sustain population growth. You cannot sustain growth in the rates of consumption of resources, and that's absolute. So any time then you have a growing population, as we do in Colorado, you're moving away from sustainability. Well, a few years ago, I had a class of non-science students. We were interested in problems of science and society. We spent a good deal of time learning to use semi-logarithmic graph paper. It's printed in such a way that these equal intervals along the vertical scale each represent an increase by a factor of 10. So you go from 1,000 to 10,000 to 100,000. And the reason you use this special paper is that on this paper, a straight line represents steady growth. Uh, we worked a lot of examples. I said to the students, let's talk about inflation. Let's talk about 7% per year. It wasn't this high when we did this. It's been higher since then, and fortunately, it's lower now. And I said to the students, as I can say to you, you have roughly 60 years life expectancy ahead of you. Let's see what some common things will cost if we have 60 years of 7% annual inflation. Well, the students found that a 55-cent gallon of gasoline will cost $35.20. 250 for a movie will be $160. The $15 sack of groceries that my mother used to buy for a dollar and a quarter, that'll be $960. A $100 suit of clothes, $6,400. A $4,000 automobile will cost a quarter of a million dollars. And a $45,000 home will cost nearly $3 million. Well, I gave the students these data. These came from a Blue Cross, Blue Shield ad. The ad appeared in Newsweek magazine. And the ad gave these figures to show the cost escalation of gallbladder surgery in the year since 1950 when that surgery cost $361. I said, make a semi-logarithmic plot. Let's see what's happening. The students found that the first four points lined up on a straight line whose slope indicated inflation of about 6% per year. But the fourth, fifth, and sixth were on a steeper line, almost 10% inflation per year. Well, then I said to the students, run that steeper line on out to the year 2000. Let's get an idea what gallbladder surgery might cost. The answer is $25,000. The lesson there is awfully clear. If you're thinking about gallbladder surgery, do it now. In the summer of 1986, the news reports indicated that the world population had reached the number 5 billion people growing at the rate of 1.7% per year. Well, your reaction to 1.7 might be to say, that's so small. Nothing bad could ever happen at 1.7% per year. So you calculate the doubling time, you find it's only 41 years. More recently, in 1999, we read that the world population had increased from 5 billion to 6 billion people. The good news is that the growth rate had dropped from 1.7% per year to 1.3% per year. The bad news is that in spite of the drop in the growth rate, the world population today is increasing by something over 80 million people every year. Now, if this modest current 1.3% per year could continue, the world population would grow to a density of one person per square meter on the dry land surface of the Earth in just 780 years, and the mass of people would equal the mass of the Earth in just 2,400 years. Now, we can smile at those. We know they couldn't happen. This one makes for a cute cartoon. The caption says, excuse me, sir, but I am prepared to make you a rather attractive offer for your square. Now, there's a very profound lesson in that cartoon. The lesson is that zero population growth is going to happen. Now, we can debate whether we like zero population growth or don't like it. It's going to happen, whether we debate it or not, whether we like it or not. It's absolutely certain people could not live at that density on the dry land surface of the Earth. Therefore, today's high birth rates will drop. Today's low death rates will rise till they have exactly the same numerical value. That will certainly be in a time short compared to 780 years. So maybe you're wondering what sort of options are available if we wanted to address the problem. In the left-hand column, I've listed some of those things that we should encourage if we want to raise the rate of growth of population and in so doing make the problem worse. Just look at the list. Everything in the list is as sacred as motherhood. There's immigration. 
medicine, public health, sanitation. These are all devoted to the humane goals of lowering the death rate. And that's very important to me if it's my death they're lowering. But then I have to realize that anything that just lowers the death rate makes the population problem worse. There's peace, law and order. Scientific agriculture has lowered the death rate due to famine. That just makes the population problem worse. The 55 mile an hour speed limit saved thousands of lives. That makes the population problem worse. Clean air makes it worse. Now in this column are some of the things we should encourage if we want to lower the rate of growth of population and in so doing help solve the population problem. Well, there's abstention, contraception, abortion, small families, stop immigration, disease, war, murder, famine, accidents. Now smoking clearly raises the death rate. Now that helps solve the problem. Well, remember our conclusion from the cartoon of one person per square meter, we concluded that zero population growth is going to happen. Let's state that conclusion in other terms and say it's obvious nature is going to choose from the right hand list and we don't have to do anything. Except be prepared to live with whatever nature chooses from that right hand list. Or we can exercise the one option that's open to us. And that option is to choose first from the right hand list. We've got to find something here we can go out and campaign for. Anyone here for promoting disease? We now have the capability of incredible war. Would you like more murder, more famine, more accidents? Well, here we can see the human dilemma. Because everything we regard as good makes the population problem worse. Everything we regard as bad helps solve the problem. Now, there is a dilemma, if ever there was one. And the one remaining question is education. Does it go in the left-hand column or the right-hand column? Well, I'd have to say thus far it's been firmly in the left-hand column. It hasn't done much about reducing ignorance of the problem. And nature is already choosing from that right-hand list. You've read about the AIDS epidemic that's devastating the continent of Africa. I had a friend back from Zimbabwe. People, he said, are dying on the streets. Nature's taking care of the problem. So where do we start? Well, let's start in Boulder, Colorado. Here's a graph of Boulder's population. There's a 1950 U.S. Census figure, 1960, 1970. In that 20-year period, the average growth rate of Boulder's population was about 6% per year. Now, we've been able to slow the growth somewhat. There's a 2000 census figure. Well, I like to ask the people, let's start with a 2000 census figure, go another 70 years, one more human lifetime, and ask, what rate of growth of Boulder's population would we need in that 70 years so that at the end of 70 years, Boulder's population would equal today's population of your choice of major American cities? Well, Boulder in 70 years could be as big as Boston is today if we just grew 2.58% per year. Now, if we thought Detroit was a better model, we'll have to shoot for 3.27% per year. And remember the historic figure on the preceding slide, 6% per year. If that could continue for one lifetime, Boulder would be larger than Los Angeles. Now, this isn't Boulder plus Broomfield, Louisville, Lafayette, the other towns in the county. This was just Boulder. Well, it's obvious you couldn't put Los Angeles in the Boulder Valley. Therefore, it's obvious Boulder's population growth is going to stop. Now, the only question is, will we be able to stop it while there's still some open space, or will we wait until it's wall-to-wall -wall people and we're all choking to death? Now, it's interesting to read what the boosters say. Some years ago, we read that doubling its population in 10 years, Boulder is indeed a stable community. What in the world are they talking about? You're going 100 miles an hour, 7% growth per year, doubling in less than 10 years, and someone makes the idiotic statement that we're stable. We're standing still. We're not moving. They don't even understand the meaning of the words that they put down on paper. Well, every once in a while somebody says, but you know, a bigger city might be a better city. And I have to say, wait a minute. We've already done that experiment. We don't need to wonder what will be the effect of growth on Boulder because Boulder tomorrow can be seen in Los Angeles today. And for the price of an airplane ticket, we can step 70 years into the future and see exactly what it's like. 